These pictures are completely familiar. This is our world. But if we stop the clock and then run it backwards, we'll reach a time that looked very different. This film is a hundred years old. Look carefully. There are bicycles and horses and electric trams, but no cars, no traffic as we know it. People are dressed differently. They stare in amazement at the movie camera because for them, movies, television and computers are unknown. Things of the future. Yet they have electric trams. They have the power of steam and the telephone has been invented. They think they're as advanced from the hundred years before them as we think we're advanced now. They're right, they are. The last 200 years has seen an unprecedented explosion of change because of science. It's the most important 200 years in history and no changes are bigger than those made possible by chemistry. New explosives will create the deadliest wars of all time. The world will speed up on oil. Fertilisers and insecticides will revolutionise food production. Synthetic fibres will clothe us. Plastics will create new products. And we will begin to understand the way life itself works. These, some of the greatest changes of all, are due to organic chemistry. So, how did it happen? For most of history, people saw the world as the creation of gods and mythical beings. They built temples to them, hoping that the gods would grant a good life, both on earth and after death. Everything was interpreted through the gods. The ancient Greeks also built magnificent temples, but as seafarers and settlers, they travelled widely. Doubts began to creep in about the gods and they looked for alternative explanations. The Greeks had many ideas about the chemistry of things, but the one who came closest to the truth was Democritus. He said that if you divided matter down and down and down, or cut it up finer and finer, eventually you'd get to something very tiny that couldn't be cut down any further. And this, he said, was the smallest possible thing. And he called it an atom, which means Greek for cannot be divided. Democritus said everything was made of these and you could make new substances by rearranging them. And this is very close to the truth as we know it today, and that's an amazing statement to have come out with two and a half thousand years ago. Democritus saw atoms in all things. He believed that there was a human soul made of atoms of fire, which gave the body movement. This idea that the chemistry of life was somehow a special case would be revived 2,000 years later even as late as 200 years ago, chemists separated matter into two major groups based on the test of fire. Wood or hair or flesh would burn up into smoke. Water or stone or metal did not burn. It seemed as if there was a great difference between the material of life and that which came directly from earth or sea or air. It was known as the vitalist divide. The great chemist, Jon Berzelius, named the materials of life organic and the others inorganic. Only living tissue, he said, could make an organic compound. Berzelius comes along at the beginning of the 19th century when the push to understand chemistry really gets underway. It's Berzelius who proposes the system of chemical symbols that we use today. For example, H2O for water. He takes the first letter of the name, H for hydrogen, and O for oxygen, and puts them together in the proportions that they combine. Two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen. He knows he can't break hydrogen or oxygen down any further. He knows that they're elements, so he accepts that they are different types of atoms. There's a lot of argument about it at this time, but basically this is the beginning of modern chemistry. 
So chemists set themselves to breaking down compounds into their atomic elements. It goes well for many inorganic compounds, but not for the organic ones. The first thing that strikes you when you look at this, which is common salt, and this, which is common sugar, is how similar they look. Common salt is an inorganic compound. It's sodium chloride, and that's one part sodium to one part chlorine. That's NaCl. The Na comes from the old name for sodium, which is natron. But when you look at the elements in sugar, you end up with C12, 12 parts carbon, H22, 22 parts hydrogen, and O11, 11 parts oxygen. It's complicated, and that's a big problem with organic compounds. They often have complicated formulas. Even so, chemists like Justus von Liebig employed an army of assistants to analyse the thousands of organic substances known. Since this generally involved oxidising them and collecting and analysing the gases created, it was slow and tricky work. Always they found carbon and hydrogen, often oxygen, sometimes nitrogen, occasionally other elements. Carbon and hydrogen, it seemed, could combine in unimaginably complex and often confusing ways. For example, this is ordinary alcohol, and this is dimethyl ether. No, the ether bottle isn't empty. Dimethyl ether is a gas. But their formula is exactly the same. C2H6O. How could such different substances have the same formula? Berzelius called such cases isomers, from the Greek meaning equal parts. It was a name, but the mystery remained. These were the darkest days of organic chemistry. Basically, they're getting all of this information which nobody can make sense of. In 1828, it gets worse. Friedrich Voller, who happened to be an ex-student of Berzelius, is heating ammonium cyanate in his lab one day. And what happens? It changes into urea. What's urea? We'll visit the toilet and smell it. Urea dissolved in water is urine. It's organic. Vorla had just created an organic chemical from an inorganic one. He had broken the rule of vitalism, that organic chemicals could only come from living things. Shocked, he did it over and over before he dared to tell anyone. Vorla himself would later compare this time to a dark jungle where organic chemists could see no path and even the trees and leaves were mysterious. But slowly, a hint of light appeared as chemists looked for patterns in the results they were getting. In 1844, Adolf Kolbe, while investigating organic acids, created acetic acid in the laboratory. Acetic acid is to vinegar what urea is to urine. Once again, an organic compound had been produced from inorganic ingredients. Apart from the fact that organic substances were complicated and hard to work with, there was clearly no fundamental differences between them and anything else. The vitalist theory was dead. However, the name organic still remains as a label for the compounds of carbon, which indeed often do come from living things. It's also in the 1840s that people began to see how distinctive groups of atoms are part of organic reactions, and that the different groups show patterns of behaviour. In 1852, Edward Franklin extracts from this a very important idea. Franklin compares the way in which many elements are combining, and he says, look, we're always getting the same patterns. It looks as though each element has its own specific combining power. If we give hydrogen atom the power of one, and the term they came to use, and we still use today, is the Latin for power, which is valence. So if we give hydrogen a valence of one, then because carbon can combine with four hydrogens, carbon must be given a valence of four. In water, two hydrogens can combine with an oxygen atom, so oxygen must be given a valence of two, and it works across the board. For example, in carbon dioxide, carbon can combine with two oxygens, that's two times two, which is carbon's four. And as Franklin said, the attracting element is always satisfied by the same number. 
Balance is a really important idea. Visualise it with these wooden blocks and hooks. Say this is hydrogen, it has one hook. Here's oxygen, it has two hooks. And here's carbon, and it has four hooks. One, two, three, four. Now you can hang four hydrogens around a carbon, that's the gas methane. Or you can unhook two hydrogens and put on an oxygen. That gives you the gas formaldehyde. Or if we take off the other two hydrogens and stick on another oxygen, there's carbon dioxide. You can easily see that because carbon has four hooks, it's the sort of atom to which lots of others can join. This idea of valence obviously suggested a new vision of how molecules were made from atoms, and it was especially useful for organics. Friedrich Kekulé suggested that if you hooked carbon atoms together into a chain, you had a backbone onto which lots of other atoms could join, making large molecules, sometimes very large and complicated molecules. Wasn't this the kind of complication they were trying to solve? Look at this, it works beautifully. Here's methane. Now, if we start a carbon chain, we'll build a whole family of compounds. Here is ethane. It's a gas like methane. Now, let's go to three carbons. This is propane. It's also a flammable gas. It's almost a liquid at room temperature. If you pressurise it in a tank, it goes liquid. Drive the car around on it, it's LPG. Now let's go to eight carbons. This is octane, one of the ingredients in petrol. Now let's go to 16 carbons. That's hexadecane, part of diesel fuel. And if you keep building the chain longer and longer, you go through heavy oils and onto bitumen. Straight away, chemists started using models like this and making representations on paper. What clinched their acceptance was the way Kekulé's system neatly explained isomers, those tricky cases where different substances had the same formula. There is no other way to put together the gas methane. But once you get up to butane with four carbons to play with, look, here's another arrangement. And what I'm making is an isomer of butane. And you can see that as the chain gets longer and longer, you can have more of these possibilities. You could have more of these side groups. You can have a greater choice of places to hang them on. In fact, by the time you get up to octadecane with 18 carbons to play with, you can have over 60,000 isomers. And that's just with two types of atom, carbon and hydrogen. Without doubt, Kekulé's structural approach was a light shining into the chemical jungle. These diagrams are still used, still taught today. They explain so much. The organic mystery was unravelling at last. By 1865, chemistry was poised to make its great leap forward.